Hi, I'm Fatuma. I'm a financial advisor at Waddle Partners here to speak with Kate today. Hi, I'm Owen from Rest Australia. Thanks for tuning into the Rest Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoy today's program. Fatuma, welcome back to the Australian Finance Podcast today. Thanks, Kate. Happy to be here. Now, I know you're very excited about today's conversation. Did you want to intro it for us? Yes, we're going to talk about something really exciting for, I suppose, advisors like myself. Um, It should also be exciting for the audience. Um, Quite an important area. It's superannuation. I know it's something we can't touch for a long time, but it does make a huge part of our wealth later down the track. So I thought it'd be worthwhile us covering that. Yep. And if anyone's new here, Fatuma is a licensed financial advisor. So she's on the register. If you want to go look her up, she's got all the qualifications and she works at Waddle Partners, who we share office space with. So I get to see her lovely face in the office most days. And vice versa. (laughs) And we thought we would talk about superannuation annual statements because Mm. I got an email last week from my super provider saying, hey, your annual statement's ready. It's got information on fees, investments, insurances you have, all that stuff and more. Mm. And it got me thinking that lots of other people have probably got their annual statements recently or are getting them very soon. And I know you have been talking about this with your friends and family recently as well. Mm. So you're going to take us through a large Australian super fund's annual statement and just give us sort of pointers to look at in today's episode and just to help us when we're looking for our own annual statement. But maybe before we get to that, why is it important that we should even look (laughs) at this document? Because I can imagine most people get it in the post or via email and don't really open it. No, and that doesn't surprise me. It is something that, you know, many of us won't be able to access for a very, very long time. I myself won't be able to really touch that until, gosh, maybe oh, at this point. decades on you. I think I've got a, few, <laughs> a fair bit of time before that happens. Um, but it is, you know, outside of the f- outside of the home, essentially. This could potentially be your other um pool of assets. So, uh, you know, with rising house prices now, this might be the primary source of wealth for a lot of people. Um, So, you know, keeping that in mind, um, you know, I'm sure you've spoken about compounding. We're talking about compounding for the next 30, 40 years. So, something that might be quite small now has that power to become quite a large portion of your wealth um, 30, 40 years from now. So, um, it's really important not to throw away that letter or (laughs) delete that email from your superannuation provider. Best to um, open that up and, you know, hopefully by the end of this episode, you're equipped with some of the, the skills to be able to interpret the information that's in it. Yeah, and if someone's listening to this and then putting time in their calendar on the weekend to go through, it shouldn't take more than 20, 30 minutes to just do a proper review of your super fund and you only need to do it once a year. It'll take you as long as watching a Netflix show. So uh, you can either do that or you can just quickly do a quick superannuation health check, um, (laughs) which will pay off in dividends. Uh, Netflix and short probably doesn't pay in the same way. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) if you sort your superannuation out early, it will allow for a lifetime of watching (laughs) Netflix. (laughs) That's right. That's right. All right. So you've got a statement from a large Mm -hmm. superannuation provider that yeah. many members will know. We won't say the name, but it is a statement that many people will see the same one this year. And you're going to take us through, but where should we start with this statement? Okay, well, um, what I like to see, and I'm sure um, we all kind of want to know, is how our superannuation is tracking. Um, so a lot of those statements will show you where you were the previous financial year and where you are current at, in the last financial year. Um so what I kind of look at is, well, how much has my superannuation gone up by? What what attributed to that? Uh, usually it's a combination of investment return 
um, as well as super contributions. Um, you might see your superannuation balance uh, accelerate, say, in the years where we've had a really good market cycle um, or even where, you know, you've boosted your contributions or you've, you know, gotten a nice little pay rise or uh, changed jobs. A lot of those factors will um, change that final value. Um, and it always captures, captures the 30 June balance of the last financial year. Uh, so something to keep in mind. The other things that you'll see in there is also a summary around the fees that you're paying as well as the insurances uh, that you, you're currently paying in, in the form of premiums. Um, so I'm happy to kind of go through some of those aspects. Um, with your insurance component, I think we'll probably go, we'll probably um, just jump into that space. Now, some of us might have insurance, some of us might not have any insurances in our superannuation. So I find it's really important to kind of just check that off. Because a lot of us would have had default insurances. Yeah, if that's we've right. Had super over the last few decades. Yes, exactly, exactly. And default really might not necessarily be the right kind of the right amount of cover for you. So um, I always like to check to see how much insurance I have, uh, whether that be in in my superannuation fund or if I'm looking at a client's superannuation report. I'm um, just getting a bit of a feel as to how much life coverage do they have? How much TPD? Do they have any income protection? Because ultimately with income protection, you're protecting your ability to continue to generate an income. And if you're someone in your 30s like myself, um, that's a very important um, asset. (laughs) Um, And whether or not, uh, you know, is it worthwhile holding insurances within your super or do you look at other um, other insurance providers to to give you that kind of coverage? Um, And yeah, superannuation can be more of a cost effective way of doing it um, for those especially who can't actually get cover with a private uh, group. Um, So it's probably a good time that if you've never thought about all of these personal insurances that doing this super review and looking at a statement could be that good flag to go, hey, I only have default insurance. Mm. Maybe I want to talk to my supervisor and change that cover. Yes. Or potentially I don't have any insurance and I want it. Yes. Or I have too much, too little, or it, I want to get it outside of super. Exactly. It definitely is a good catalyst to kind of prompt you to review that, um, especially those who have mortgages, if you've got a family. Um, it's, it's certainly worthwhile considering um, reviewing your insurances. Uh, if you find that overwhelming it, doing it yourself, you can always engage an advisor like myself or you can engage insurance brokers as well. So there are people out there who can help you um, work out how much cover you need and go from there. Um The other part uh, that I find a lot of people have been stuck on is, we are just talking about this before, but death benefit nominations. It seems to be something that people uh, don't quite have an understanding around. So superannuation is actually a separate form of, uh, is separate to your estate assets. So when you pass away, the the trustee gets to um, either uh, elect who the benefits go to, and usually they'll look for family members, or you can actually direct the trustee to pay your superannuation to a certain individual or even this estate. So when I was a lot younger, I actually nominated my sibling. This is before I knew um, who you could elect in superannua- with superannuation benefits. Um, but you can only really – there's only certain individuals that you can you can nominate to receive your super um, when you pass away uh, – someone like myself, I'm single, um, if I don't have that de facto or a spouse to pass it on to and say if I want my family to receive those benefits, then really my only option where I don't have a financial interdependent relationship with them is that I need to pass that through my legal personal representative, which ultimately is the estate. Yeah. So I do find a lot of people when I look at their statements, there's either no beneficiary nominated or they've nominated a parent or a sibling. or they've got a non-lapse, um, a non-binding nomination. So usually that will happen if they've nominated someone that can't actually receive it, but the trustee has some understanding that they would like that family member to receive it. Whether it would actually get paid to them is a whole other question. Okay. So, so looking at the statement, you're looking for the words binding, non-binding. Yes. So you death nomination is that what the words yeah, are looking so for? Yeah. So you are looking for uh, yeah. It'll either say non-binding death nomination or non-binding death benefit nomination. When it says that, that really means it's at the discretion of the trustee. If you want it to go to your spouse or your de facto or your estate, um, if it's done correctly, then it should be recorded as a non-lapsing binding death benefit nomination or a binding death benefit nomination. Yeah. So if we 
we're looking at our super statement right now and it says not provided. That might be Nothing's a reminder <laughs> that we have to fill in a form. That's right. So that's right. another task that we have to complete. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, unfortunately, unlike, say, your investment options in super where you could probably do that over your phone or, you know, you jump on your computer and you can make that switch with a death benefit nomination, some funds still require you to actually physically sign it, scan it and send it through because it is a legally binding um, document. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm pretty sure I had to manually send <laughs> that form through. Yeah. And what about fees? Because that's probably something that we should be checking how much we've been paying throughout the year. Yes. Yeah, so the fees component, that could include a couple of items. So typically you've got your administration fees. That'll depend on which superannuation fund you're with. Um, a lot of industry funds will charge a flat admin fee. So they might charge you, say, a dollar a week. So you're only paying about $52 for the week, uh, for the year, sorry. Um, and then on top of that, some of them might actually charge like an asset based fee or a percentage fee. So you'll see both those fees as part of an administration fee component. Uh, The other component, if you have insurance, is obviously the insurance premiums that are coming out. And another one will be your indirect investment or your investment costs. Uh, And so what that is, typically you'll see in your statement, there's a return. It's usually a net return. So what that means, it's it's the um, the return that you've gotten from your investments after they've accounted for any of the costs associated with generating that that return um, for that product. Um, And I don't think many people understand that. Uh, It's always worthwhile. Every investment option has a different investment fee related to that. So um, some of the more stable, capital stable or conservative models tend to be a a little bit cheaper than say your growth or your balanced um, investment options, um, which kind of flows into investment options. <laughs> yeah, that's probably another um, good thing we should be yeah. checking up on. So as we look at our fees, we also look at the investment component. So, um, you know, how is your superannuation currently invested? Is it invested for the – it's invested for the long run really for people, you know, so if you're in your 30s or 40s, you've got a good – 35 years maybe before you're probably going to be able to access that. Um, So, you know, you've got to have a think about whether or not, you know, say being in a conservative portfolio, uh, conservative option is um, sensible for that kind of investment timeframe. Or you might be towards the later stages of life where you probably might not want to be as aggressive with your superannuation. So, understanding how long you're going to be invested for Understanding compounding as well um, all kind of flows into the investment option uh, that you probably want to have a look at and and switch into. Um, and then obviously there's the costs associated with that um, yeah. with that other product. So your super statement will probably just tell you what you have. What you have and then yeah. you have to go into the website for your provider and then look under products or investment options exactly. or portfolios and then click on that and then you can the see – what's inside of it. That's right. Yeah, That's if right. you want to learn. So if it, it says I'm in a growth portfolio and I'm looking at my statement right now, mm-hmm. if I want to find out what's inside of that, I have to go to the website and you do. Yeah. get a and, breakdown. Yeah, unfortunately, not all statements will um, provide you with a breakdown of how a growth in that example is invested. So yeah. when it comes to the asset allocation, um, some super funds are really good at kind of give you a bit, giving you a bit more information as to the underlying investments. I think a lot of um, funds are becoming a lot more transparent about what makes a balanced portfolio or, or a balanced option, um, which is great. So having that transparency is fantastic. And then also, um, you know, when you go online, you can probably get a lot more historical performance as well and, and compare that against another option within that same super fund provider. Yeah, because um, that's probably your statement will also have details on performance. Yeah, yeah, for a certain period of time. That's yeah, right. So yeah. you can get the detailed, if you want even more, more yeah, nitty gritty, it's probably can. worth at least least once looking at the Definitely. website and seeing, okay, I'm in a growth portfolio. What does that mean? Yes. Is that right for my time frame? Yes. What's the long-term performance? And yep. maybe compare it to me two other super funds. To yes. See. Yes, certainly you can do that. Um, and I like, you know, you know, if I'm looking at one particular fund and if that client wants to stay within that fund, then um, when you're online, you can actually track that perform, say the performance of a balanced option relative to, say, a growth option. Um, A lot of them have that graphical representation, which is fantastic, especially when you're trying to show that to a client. Um, So, yeah, definitely go beyond your statement. Your statement should really be your prompt to look further into it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good tool to remind Mm. you about things like Mm -hmm. fees. You might be paying more or less than Mm -hmm. other competitive options. You might be in a super fund that hasn't been performing. That's right. That's right. Um, uh, a, a good way to kind of compare your superannuation funds. Uh, there's there's 
websites like Chant West who lets you do a comparison between the Apple, one. the Apple one, which I, which is quick and easy and very, you know, it's convenient for people to be able to navigate um, if you want to compare your superannuation funds that way. Um, and yeah, you can always jump onto the website of another, um, could be industry, retail, any other super, superannuation fund, as long as that option, investment option is there, you can always measure that performance against what you currently have. Mm. There's yeah. a lot more scrutiny these days on super funds mm-hmm. that are continuously underperforming. And I know last year, I think it was last year, it was a bit of a shock for the first time when people got letters. Yeah, because I think a lot of people, it kind of goes back to the start of this conversation is that people don't really pay attention to how their superannuation funds are performing or even their superannuation full stop, let alone, you know, performance. Um, and hopefully that has been a catalyst for a lot of people to reevaluate their super fund, not just on a performance um, perspective, but also as a product around the fees as well, because you've got a poor performing super fund, but then you also might be paying a fair bit in fees as well. So um, always worthwhile um Doing an annual review, I, I find that the annual statement is my prompt to review everything again. Yeah, because yeah. I think that's where we get confused because superannuation is just the vehicle and mm-hmm. we have to decide what goes inside of it. So that's right. So there's superannuation and then you have to pick your investment option inside of that and then you can pick things like insurance if you want to add that on. Exactly, exactly. It's certainly... Um, Yes, exactly what you're saying. It it is a structure. You've got a lot more flexibility nowadays than you did before. Um, you can pull many different levers. You know, you can put more contributions into your super fund if you want to. You can increase the insurances within your super fund or decrease them. You, I think people might see that they've got a level of insurance and just continue on with that. Um, you have the power to cancel that. Um, you have the power to put in more than your employer puts in for you. It's a very flexible um, structure. Yeah. You just can't access it. That's probably the only catch for now. Yeah. And it's probably a good reminder as well, looking at your annual statement, You there should be some sort of transaction history, or yes. at least you can look at that online to check that your employer has been paying it. Very important. Um, we've, you know, obviously heard stories about, you know, people uh, not getting superannu- their superannuation paid. There's also some stories around wage theft. Um, you know, if you're not getting your wages, it's likely you probably didn't also get your employer contributions too. Um, a good, simple way. We've got a nice flat number. This financial year. So it's really 11% of your base salary usually. Um, so I would just use that as your gauge to see that your um, the super contributions that you're receiving from your employer are on point. Um, yeah, the transaction history is, is a great way for you to check that. Yeah. And it's always worth asking if your wage is inclusive of super yes. or if you've got your wage plus super because right. that will change numbers as well. Very much so, yes, yes. And a really good negotiation tool too. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> if you were looking at a friend's super statement right mm. now and you had it in front of you, what would be some red flags? So if you're you're looking through just as a friend and what would jump out to you if something had been, the super hadn't been going very well this year? Um, a couple of things would stand out to me. Well, it depends also on, you know, what their employment situation is. If you had a friend, full-time worker, um, you know, they've been employed for since, I don't know, since after uni. A couple of things that would prompt me is how much they have in super. That would probably, because you can kind of gauge, I suppose as an advisor, you can kind of gauge how much people generally have at this point. Um, The other thing I would be looking at is how much fees they're paying. That's certainly something that would stand out to me. And is, yeah, is the performance relative to how other funds have performed? Um, Obviously, you're going to get some variation between everybody. Everyone's going to want to be the leader in in returns. (laughs) If the return seems way off compared to other um, superannuation fund providers, then I'd probably alert them to that too. Uh, But yeah, they're the key things, I think. What's their balance looking like? How much, what's been their performance and how much are they paying in fees? Two, three very easy things to kind of look at very quickly. Yeah, awesome. Because yeah. there's a lot we can do right now to make some really positive changes for our future. Definitely, definitely. Um, don't think of it as something that's a set and forget. I, it just anytime I hear people not, you know, talking about superannuation when my circle of friends kind of, you know, go to sleep as soon as I say, well, superannuation. I mean, they've drifted off. It seems to be the case with a lot of them. They don't realize how important it is um, and how how much 
influence it'll have in the type of retirement that you'll have in the future. Um, so yeah, so if you can, if you could, when you get your statements or if you have your statements, have a look and see how you've performed the last 12 months, have a look at what's contributed to that increase. Uh, if it's investment return, if it's super contributions, have a look at how much you're paying for insurances. Is it worthwhile maintaining um, or is it enough? Um, consider perhaps whether, um, you know, there can be some benefits to having insurances definitely within super, but there are also some benefits to having, say, an income protection policy out of super, especially if you're on the higher income end because those premiums are tax deductible. Um, and then also think about how much you're paying in your fees. If I can leave everybody with a, a few pointers. Yeah. And the no. death benefit nomination. Definitely. Very, very important. <laughs> and if you're someone, you're looking at your statement and going, I just want someone to tell me right now if I'm in a good fund. This is so overwhelming and I'm looking at comparison sites and it's confusing. Yeah. You can talk to a financial advisor about this stuff. Yes, you can certainly talk to a financial advisor about it. Um, there's a lot of um, many advisors out there who would be more than happy to do a quick health check for you. Um, you know, if, you, if you're overwhelmed with reading resources, there's a lot of great podcasts out there um, who talk about, who give you the key kind of pointers to, to decide which way to go when it comes to industry or retail super funds or even, you know, if you've accumulated enough, maybe even a self-managed super fund um, as an option. Um, but, yeah, certainly an advisor can always help you with that health, that superannuation health check. Yeah, awesome. And mm. we did a two-part sort of series on superannuation a few months ago with a wonderful financial advisor, Jess Brady, people yeah. can have a listen to. And we've also got a sort out your super free course on RASC education. So that's another helpful tool for anyone. Well, Fatuma, thank you for coming on today. I think it's a good way just to give people a little health check on their super fund and just some of those things to look at when you're going through your annual statement this year. Thanks again for having me and um, hopefully it's helped a few of uh, the listeners out there. Amazing. <laughs> Thanks, Fatima. Thanks, Kate.